Wow, I did not know that there were so many bees in the world and especially in Jamaica. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. 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 Can you hear me blink twice? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing much faces. Oh, there we go. All Hi. right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Spence. All right. I, I'm just going to invite persons to um, start up their cameras because it's a very interactive session we're having today. Um, but before that, I want to just introduce myself. Hello, everyone, again. My name is Onika Granum, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the Natural History um, Museum of Jamaica's World Bee Day webinar. I guarantee you that today, the program, it, it have a buzz. See what I did there? <laughs> you get it? No? Okay. Got it. <laughs> oh, moving right along. <laughs> The Institute of Jamaica is Jamaica's premier cultural um, agency with the mandate to encourage literature, science, and art since 1879. Very buzzy, right? Yeah? Yeah, I'm gonna be using that word a lot today. <laughs> so here at the IOJ, we have the responsibility for some of Jamaica's distinguished cultural entities, one of which is the host for today's symposium, that's the Natural History Museum of Jamaica. So um, bear with me now as, as we just get in our minds. When you think about biodiversity, when you think about research and publications, when you think about the scientific national collection, and even when you think about educational libraries and programs, when you think about our natural environment and the importance of protecting and preserving it, well, I don't, I don't want to brag too much, but that's where the Natural History Museum of Jamaica come in. It's like no other museum in Jamaica. And speaking about being like no other, our specially invited guests from the creative, private, and public sectors, they are the ones who embody this year's theme for World Bee Day, which is Be Engage, celebrating the diversity of bees and beekeeping. But I'm gonna stop buzzing so much now, and I'll let Mr. Gavin Campbell, who is our host, introduce each of them. And I want each one who has joined today have a very um, engaging and, well, be engaged <laughs> and a buzzing time today. So thank you all and have a great session. Hi, right, good afternoon, everyone. Just confirming that you can hear me. Just a nod, or yes, I'll say, awesome. So good afternoon. Thank you so much to everyone for being present at our incredibly awesome and incredibly educational event on World Bee Day. World Bee Day is something that I'm passionate about and everyone here else would be passionate about as well. So we are going to highlight different aspects that people are involved and you can get involved in being a part of supporting the incredible bees of our country and our world. So first up, we have Mr. Hugh Smith, who is the Chief Plant Collection Officer at the Apiculture Unit at the Ministry of Agriculture. He is a professional agriculturalist. He's an environmental scientist and a policy instructor as well. So he's very expansive in all the things that he does to be able to support bees. He also has been working for the Ministry of Agriculture for 27 years, and he is now, as mentioned earlier, the officer or the chief plant protection officer at the Agriculture Unit. He has been engaged in both research and policy and regulation of beekeeping and has a bachelor's in general agriculture and a master's in natural resource management, both from the University of the West Indies. So, Mr. Hugh Smith, thank you so much. We're going to be hearing an overview of the bee industry from him with all his accolades and all his experience. So, Mr. Smith, over to you. All right. Thank you very much for having me um, at this session. Now, Bee Day is really a passionate time for me. Um, it brings focus on our natural resource, our honeybee, that sometimes we take for granted that we have honeybees and we just see them as insects walking around, flying around, crawling around. Um, we have beekeepers who, you just see some beekeepers around and you're not even looking at the beekeeper to see the contribution that he has made to um, agriculture in general, right? So I will do a short presentation on trying to celebrate World Bee Day with Jamaica 
with um, institutions, with persons within the Caribbean, because there are persons in St. Lucia who is on at this time, and other Caribbean islands were also on at this time. Now, I will move into the theme, be engaged and celebrating the diversity of bees and beekeeping systems. Uh, we take these words for granted. Um, we only see beekeepers sometimes to take some honey from them, um, to purchase honey from them, but we don't know the trouble that the beekeeper has to go through to maintain the lives of these pollinators. Now, we work out of the Ministry of Agriculture, Research and Development Division. Uh, we're stationed at Borders Research Station in Old Harbor. And this is just part of the renovation that the ministry is involved in um, to get the research stations up and running. So Borders is probably the first of four or five stations that they have to renovate. So research and development encompasses outstations um, that do different crops, different research activities, um, and that all boils down to information that we carry or we present to the beekeeping public. Three things that we focus on, and our focus is on some aspects of research, the regulatory part of the industry and the extension service. I can tell you right now that the extension service is the component in the unit that consumes the most funds. And the extension part of it takes you into the different areas of Jamaica, takes you into the farmer's premises, takes you into these beehives, and as such, we're able to do a lot of surveillance for different pests and diseases. So an extension officer, uh, when he provides a service to you, he is all in, also doing something in relation to protecting the national stock. So he'll tell you how to, 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 to manage your hives, how to manipulate your hives, how to get your hives in such a position that they are productive. But he also is looking for major threats that are affecting the industry. One of those threats is the American fall bow disease. So your extension officer provides a service to you and the rest of the farmers, not only in the sense of you learning, but also in protecting the industry from different challenges. In terms of some of the services we also provide, and this is what you consider to be an apiary. I know most persons online may be beekeepers. Those who are not beekeepers will consider this to be a collection of beautiful boxes. Uh, but really and truly, if you go into those boxes, you're going to find honeybee that will protect themselves if you go in and you're not prepared. So when the extension officer goes out, he's servicing operations looking like this for different purposes. This is a nice layout of what an apron look like. It's a collection of many colonies of bees. Even if you had one, it would have been an apron because it's a location that has bees in production. We also collect the information from the farmers. I know RADA is based in collecting information on all farmers. So RADA, your every beekeeper is a farmer and is asked to register with RADA. But every beekeeper is also asked to register their apris, and this is where the bees are with the Ministry of Agriculture. And to make life easier for the farmers, you can simply register, go onto the Ministry of Agriculture website. You can look for the Research and Development Division, which you'll see in the left side of, of your screen. And you can um, indicate on that, and it takes you to the apiculture unit. You can look in, in research and development, you'll find apiculture. And on the apiculture, you'll find apiary registration forms. Now, instead of coming to the office, you can simply go to the link that exists, and it takes you on a document looking like this. 
Now, the document will indicate the year that you're registering. It will take certain basic information from you as a beekeeper. So it takes your name, your, if you're not the manager for the operation, if there's a manager for the operation, it, take, it collects your TRN number. And one of the purposes of using your TRN number is that we assign the numbers of the aprons according to your TRN number. Um, in addition to that, it will ask you for your email address, contact information, and to, for you to indicate the exact location of your apres. Now, so if you have an apre in the middle of, well, I should not say the middle of halfway tree, uh, but if it's in Papin, in a specific lane in Papin, then you'd ask to say it's in Guangolain Papin or three Guangolain Papin, um, St. Andrew, and you'd indicate the number of colonies that exist. And we are encouraging beekeepers to practice, to recall the apron number that they have. So it's really the apron number is part of your TRN number, it's the parish in which you're located, and also there's either 001, 002, 003, depending on where your apron, when your apron was documented. So you'll get back something indicating um, the registration process. However, when you submit document to the office, it is not just taken as gospel to say that you have those numbers of colonies because it now becomes an official document. So what we have to do, we do something known as a verification. So sometimes our extension officer will have to come into the field and see how many colonies do exist in the field. And with that very ver verification, then a document is prepared to indicate that you have registered your operation. Now, someone asked me today, what is the benefit of registering? First thing, registration or registering your APRI is a legal requirement from the ministry. So all beekeepers are asked to register their APRIs by January 31st of each year or 30 days, within 30 days of establishing a new operation or expanding their beekeeping operation. So legally, you're asked to register your APRIs. Why would the ministry want you to re register your APRIs? For registration, it's critical that... For, for registration, it's critical um, I just pause to find out if, if you're hearing me. Can I get a feedback from someone? Yes, I'm hearing you well. You're hearing well, okay. Um, so as it relates to the process of registration, if you are doing business and it involves your beekeeping operation, then this document is taken to the different agencies along with what is provided by RADA to indicate that this is the level of investment that you have in the field. So if you're talking about investment in the field, the document you present to us and we prepare from that gives you that official guide to an institution to say, this is the level of investment you have on the ground. Now, if you're talking about um, record keeping, Every visit your extension officer makes to your operation or any organization that visits or any beekeeper who visits and provides you with a service, the back of the card allows for documentation. So it allows you to put in what has been done. Is there any, anything that has been noticed? Is there any change that was made? Is, was it treated with a particular pesticide? And when should that pesticide be removed? So this document provides such a a critical um, tool for your record keeping side. If you are moving honeybees along the roadway, then it's also important that you get a permit. You see this, this um, truck is packed with bees for delivery. Prior to packing the truck for delivery, the colonies would have been inspected. So you apply for a permit, an inspection is done, and if, if it is safe for you to move those bees along the roadway, it has no pest or disease of, of critical importance, 
then that permit is granted and then you can proceed to pack the truck with bees. It also has a guide as how to have these trucks packed. So if you're going far distance, then it's, it will tell you that you need to cover the truck or cover the bees with what is considered to be um, mesh covers that allows air to get in and out of the colony, but the bees cannot get out. So it may even say that you need to mesh the entrance so that the bees are, tra are transported safely um, on the roadway. So this is what the application for transportation of bees permit looks like. A permit would have been developed for you on the receipt of the inspection results in the field. Now, another thing that we do, there is situation that speaks about the hornet. And the hornet is, we have put in place a few traps at the ministry, APRI, to determine if we have anything looking like the hornet. We have not seen anything like the hornet. It's really sour material, preferably vinegar, um, pie, um, cuttings from fruits that are used in this trap, and it do attract other insects. So if we had the hornet at, say, bottles, then we would have found some of it in these traps. So it's, it's another way of seeing what we have in our operation. Um, this is again a, con a continuous stand with bees, colonies of bees, and they are set for production at this particular location. We do a lot of training, and uh, training comes at the parish level. So each officer, so if you're in Kingston and St. Andrew, for example, you have an extension officer who would be responsible for conducting field training with you. So you can usually contact us for that information. Now for Suzette Bernard Miller, it will be Kingston and St. Andrew, um, and she will have her training on set days, second and fourth Tuesdays of, of each month. Um, for the parishes of Hanover, St. James, Han and Trelawney, um, first Thursdays, second Wednesdays, and last Tuesdays would have been their preferred dates. So I'll just swift through some of these. Um, Atoy Williams, for St. Elizabeth and West Milan. Uh, we have Wayne Anderson for uh, Manchester, Clarendon, and St. Anne. We have also Quasi Palmer for Portland, St. Mary, and St. Thomas. So these are really the contact points. Our training session also extends to the point where we have every second Thursday interaction sessions online. These interaction sessions allow for beekeepers to update, update their, themselves with modern information. Sometimes we draw from um, information in North America. Sometimes we draw information from local uh, persons to present. So those second Thursdays are really information sessions to target specific needs of the clients in our training. Last Thursdays of each month, we do have training sessions for in modules. So if you are a new investor, every last Thursday of the month, you can simply call us at Borders and there is a training session for new persons. So they are placed in modules. And if you have institutions who require the service of training, then we usually package that at a cost and we deliver at your location to the clients that you have. And we usually say at a cost. Our main objective, all we speak about in Jamaica, our extension, our research, our regulatory functions are aimed at protecting Jamaica to be stuck. And we do protect this even at the border. Uh, you see a, a hive, and this was marked Ministry of Agriculture, and there's a telephone number on it. And you would have seen this place in different locations that are close to the ports of entry. All we're doing is saying, if bees comes in at the port, then there are swarm traps that are available for the bees to go into. So any bees that are found in these swarm traps at the ports of entry are usually, samples are taken and the bees are killed in an effort to protect our borders from 
bees coming from other countries. So this is a protection system. I know the one was put up in Kingston, and when we went back, there was no box. Um, it was stolen. So if you see boxes with Ministry of Agriculture and a telephone number on it, um, written on it, and it may say, do not touch, do not trouble, um, that is for the collection of swarms that may end up on the ports that we have here. We have to protect from the point of the ports because we have a lot of vessels coming in. And these vessels from time to time will take in um, bees of different, from different country. And this was just an inspection that looking something like me, not me really, but it, it looks, an image looking like me. I was a, a little bit tired. And what we had to do to the right of, my, of the picture, you'll see a mesh. This is really a container that was there and we had to put a mesh around it because um, bees were seen coming from that con container after it was imported into the shores of Jamaica. So we had to put that mesh around it so that when you open the container, any bees that was found in that container would normally be collected in the mesh. If they escape, then they would be in that mesh for collection. This was a check again to make sure that we did not see anything coming out of this shipping container. This was done recently on someone importing a specific product. And what we did was to see if um, we had bees there. Anyhow bees comes on the port, your container will be seized. It will be put into a restricted area and the necessary process will have to follow where they may have to fumigate the container. Um, they may have to fog the container to kill any insect that is found in these container, containers. So this is a means of protecting the borders that we have here. This is, these are just simple aprons providing some contribution or contributing to the ecosystem, uh, contributing to the pollinator pool that we have locally. And these are all placed in different locations around Jamaica. It's an investment for the beekeeper, but it's also a contributor to the environment. Recently, we engaged the bee farmers across Jamaica in a tree planting effort. We decided that we wanted to plant trees. We wanted to plant fruit trees. And we engaged associations for them to be the, the vessel in terms of distribution and planting the trees for the benefit of the environment and for that awareness and planting that seed of awareness in the farmers in, and the communities would have been our start this year. So Food for the Poor was a contributor in the program with forestry. And also we had Trees That Feed Foundation who assisted in providing trees for the, the, the project. So we had 550 fruit trees contributed by Trees That Feed Foundation. And we had another 1500 trees that were, were contributed by um, Food for the Poor with assistance from forestry. And I think Trees That Feed Foundation may have also contributed to the effort of having trees been planted by the farmers. Um, so natural resources that exist, or oh, you may be wondering which plants these are. These are plants that you see around you every day. You need to stop, take a picture of the flowers, the pollen grains, the different things that are there. Um, and these are taken just in the field when I went out recently. I ask a few persons if they know this, the flowers from this um, plant. And this is really the guinep. So next time you see plants around, next time you see flowers around, stop, take a picture, of the flowers and see how beautiful it is. And remember, uh, Guinep do contribute significantly to the production of honey in some parishes. So this is where plants do get a lot of nectar and they do get pollen for contribution to the national honey crop. This is a close up on your Guinep tree or Guinep flower. And this is our famous Aki flower. 
I know you may be saying, this is beautiful. Have you ever stopped to take these pictures? Next time you plant, pass a plant that is flowering, just stop, take a picture of a flower and see what it looks like. And it may be looking like this. Um, and this is from Aki. And this is our normal honeybee collecting nectar from the, the Aki plant or Aki flower. And these are honeybee that are really hard at work. And in support, as I go back to the tree plant in effort island-wide, this was just a collection of these trees. We had a wide range of trees that contribute a lot of nectar and pollen to the industry, but we could not go without tools. So again, Food for the Poor was approached and each parish association was given a set of tools to, so that they could engage the communities, engage the rest of farmers, engage the schools in a tree planting effort. So you'll see me go through a few slides. This is the Manchester Bee Farmers Association, hard at work planting trees, um, taking, trying to put them in areas that are fenced and have them protected as we go along. So this is Manchester Bee Farm Association um, in their bid to have Aki being planted and different fruit trees in process. I don't know, my officer, oh, Mr. Mr. Wayne Anderson, um, Mr. Wayne Anderson was also part of the team in planting trees. So this is one of our officers. I don't know if he was trying to get up or after planting the tree, but the camera had caught him somewhere close to the tree that he had just planted. Um, tools been delivered to the St. Catherine Bee Farmers Association, to the um, New Harbor Village housing scheme. There are so many housing schemes that are going up. Can we as community leaders, as bee farmers, as concerned citizens go back to these communities, go back to these new housing development and simply give a housewife, give a husband in the, in the home one plant. So if you do one plant per household in these new development, it will be so appreciative because they'll be looking for fruits from these trees that you are putting in. So this young man in New Harbor 4 in Old Harbor was play, planting his tree for it to, to, to go. I think this is an apple that he was putting away at the back of his, his premises in New Harbor 4. Simply same New Harbor 4, lady place putting her um, sauce up in, in, in the ground. Um, Manchester, this was St. Anne B Farmers Association, hard at work, a team that, that was developed from the association and they did some amount of tree planting. St. Elizabeth Bee Farmers Association joined the effort and collection of tools and plants. And this is one of our hardworking extension officer, Mr. Atoy Williams. And I usually say um, he has worked so hard in making sure that honeybee is protected. So this was a trip to one of the nurseries for the collection of the trees that were donated. He delivered these trees and, and uh, tools to the Westmoreland Bee Farmers Association. And I tell you, Westmoreland Bee Farmers have gone into some of the schools and have done great amount of planting of these trees in schools for their protection and livelihood. It doesn't matter age. Um, the Kingston and St. Andrew Bee Farmers Association has been influential in having trees in the ground. I know they had requested additional trees for planting in communities so that they can contribute to the national um, tree planting effort. Um, St. James um, will also collect plants and all, will be going into production. Trelawney. And this is Clarendon Bee Farmers Association. So you see that all bee farmers association in Jamaica are involved in the process of tree planting. Eltham Primary School, done by St. Catherine Bee Farmers Association, they were also involved in the process of tree planting. It's, it doesn't stop there. We also engage in the conversion of 
products from the beehive, honey, royal jelly, pollen, propolis, and convert them into value-added um, products. So this was part of the farmer to farmer assistance and farmer to farmer assistance is there for every person in the agriculture world. They will assist you in training. It does not cost you a dollar from the side of the organization. All you have to do is contact farm to farmer program. It's a USAID uh, support and they will do all that it takes to have someone here train you for two weeks in, in a practical sense and have you moving on with your investment. I think this was an engagement with our staff, RADA staff, and the trainer who is on the extreme left in making value-added products. Um, Queen Rearing was also another initiative so that we could select the stock that we work with in form of protection. Um, so Queen Rearing was another effort. Inspection for disease, another activity. This man is so happy looking at the queens that he were involved in producing. So he was just inspecting the queen cells for um, to see how his training has gone on. On-farm training is really our activity. There are many steps to on-farm training that we're involved in from the Ministry of Agriculture. At the end of my my display or my, my presentation, I want us to look at value-added products and where we can take them as an industry. This is really honey wine that is here, honey sticks, honey stored in straws. And I'll just go through a few of the slides. B propolis pet cream, B propolis ointment. Um, this is a B propolis mouth and nasal spray. Um, these are pet shampoos, and there's a wide range of things that have come out of the beekeeping trade. Ladies and gentlemen, I will stop at this point, and I do thank you for listening to me. I know at some point the volume went down. We do apologize for that, but thanks again for listening to um, me. Do have a great bee day, May 20, 20. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. It was incredibly, <laughs> incredibly important for us to know all about the bee industry, how we can get involved as individuals and what products and activities we can be become engaged in. So thank you so much for highlighting that. On the next item for the agenda, we have a video talking about bees and how they can be important. So basically, in terms of just some facts about bees. So just going to have the History Museum roll that up and we can get straight into it.
All right, thank you so much for that video. It was quite enlightening. I saw that there was a reference to royal jelly. And when I was just a, a kid, just as sharing an, an anecdote, when I was a kid, I saw that royal jelly was made from the saliva of bees as well as honey. So me in my very childish kid brain thought that I could use my own saliva and feed that saliva to bees to get them to turn into queens, but that did not work out. <laughs> it was quite disappointing, but from then on, I've learned much more about bees, so won't be trying that again. So next on the agenda, we have Mr. Adrian Watson, who is the CEO of Honeybees and also a Chevening Scholar. He got his, B his BSc in Geography and Zoology from the University of the West Indies. He's currently a Chevening Scholar doing an MSc in Conservation and Land Management at Bangor University in Wales. He aspires to significantly transform Jamaica's environmental and conservation sectors, as well as teach people more about bees. He's the CEO of Honeybees, as mentioned before, which is a small enterprise which focuses on sustainable beekeeping for Jamaica to help in order to combat climate change. The beekeeping that he does also focuses on training for youth in low-income countries, as well as wards of the state. He is also the executive director of the Jamaica Environment Entrepreneurs Advocacy Network, or GENE, very long, but awesome, which aids to have social enterprises advance their climate smart and nature-based solutions for protecting biodiversity and managing our ecosystems. In 2020, he was a, an Unleashed Fellow as well as a, U, a REAP Agritech Fellow. And in 2021, he was a YLEI Fellow. So Mr. Watson will be presenting today on some bees. So Mr. Watson, over to you. Let's have fun. Sorry, was just having some technical difficulties. Where are you able to see my screen? I am seeing that it says that it's start, it has started sharing, but I'm not seeing anything on the screen just yet. So possibly you could stop sharing and then reshare. It's coming up, I think. Okay, it's coming up. Okay, awesome. All right, while that is loading, oh, it's taking a little bit longer than expected. I see a notification saying that he has started um, sharing the screen, but I haven't seen the screen All right. shared yet. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and allow the um, um, the team to, oh, it's... Okay. I'm going to allow the team to share on my behalf, um, and then I'll just signal you to um, go through for me. Thanks very much. Okay, so let's begin. As you heard, um, I'm a geographer and zoologist, um, and uh, I run a social enterprise called Honeybees Apiary. Um, you can skip to the next slide. So a little bit of background on bees. Um, there are about 20,000 bee species worldwide, and I'm not sure about the amount of species in Jamaica, but here in the UK, there are about 270 um, bee species here. Um, <clears throat> I know for our local bees, they're a hybrid between um, the bees found in Europe and uh, um, North um, Africa. <clears throat> Sorry again, if you could skip. So, so we have an indigenous bee population in Jamaica that is a stingless bee. Um, it uh, tends to um, make its um, hive out of what looks, like, looks to be mud and it has some honey pots that surround it. Um, I, I personally um, have only encountered this particular um, type of bee about twice. Um, and I know Mr. Um, Smith knows a lot about this particular type of bees. So um, I'm trying to encourage um, the protection of our forests because they tend to live within our close forests like the cockpit country and the Blue Mountains. And I know there were a few spotted near Mason River. Um, so I'm actually trying to promote Mr. Smith and the Natural History Museum to do a little bit more research on this particular 
style of bees um, and maybe come up with some innovative ways of which we can manage and utilize them as a resource. If we could skip. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so whilst I'm waiting on the next slide to appear. Hello? Next slide. I can hear you, but there seems to be some disconnect. Okay, good now. All right, so some honeybees, honeybee facts. Um, so sometimes a bee has to, to um, visit about 5,000 flowers to just make one single teaspoon. Um, they also live for about six weeks on average. It might be more, it might be less, depending on where you put them and how hard they have to work. Um, they... Uh, they are known to be, in quote, very fuel efficient. And scientists here seem to think that because of their body morphology, they should not actually have the skill to fly. But bees and honeybees as a pollinator tend to defy the odds all the time. Um, one colony um, can have as much as 100,000 bees in it. Um, and of course, the type of honeybees, Apis mellifera, that we raise here in Jamaica are not native like the indigenous um, bees that I mentioned before. So um, care needs to be taken in terms of how you position your hives and where you position your eyes in consideration for our native populations. Um, next slide. So um, the the high um, when we're talking about beekeeping, you might hear um, beekeepers throwing around a few terms: a colony, a hive, a honeycomb, brood. As you could hear from Mr. Smith's presentation, so a lot of people think that the hive is synonymous with the, the collection of bees themselves. Sometimes, not quite. It mostly just refers to the structure, right? Um, and the colony itself um, with the queen, the workers, the, um, uh, the drones are the colony. And so what in, in, in biology, we call this a super organism. So the hive here, the, the, the colony here is a super organism filled with many parts, kind of like our bodies. We have a brain, we have an eye, uh, we have eyes, we have nose, and they all work together to keep us alive. Next slide. So um, looking at one individual within that super colony, it moves from eggs to larvae to pupa to an adult bee. Um, an adult bee, um, as I, I said before, um, takes three different formats. The queen is from a fertilized egg, but she's been fed royal jelly so that her ovaries can mature. And she goes out on her mating flight, mates with drones, which are the third, uh, which are the second type of bees. They're made from unfertilized eggs, um, unlike the worker and the queen. Now, what separates the queen from the workers is that the worker does not have developed ovaries and she would not have gone out on a mating flight. So they don't actually um, lay unless they lose a queen and then they, they, they realize and they get in a panic and then they start laying drones, drone eggs, right? So yeah, next slide. Um, and I would have mentioned these three before, um, queen, worker, drone. And as you can um, tell, they play distinctly different roles. The queen is the mother of all the um the, the colonies are all, all she's literally what we consider the head of the colony itself the challenge is if you actually look at it who's really the boss the queen the worker the drone because yes yeah, she might lay eggs and she might um extend her pheromones to help calm the hive but the workers also do actually make a few decisions. So for example, if a colony swarms, as, and I'll show you a picture of a swarm later on, um, 
it's the workers who decide where to go and where um where the new suitable home he- is. And if a colony produces um more than one queen to swarm, they can actually determine whether they allow all of the queens to survive. Um, if they if they are insisting on doing multiple swarms, they will literally close the queen cells artificially to allow them to escape one by one. Um, the drones are really um, subservient to everybody else, and when the, the colony doesn't need them anymore, they can literally force them out of the hive. So, yeah. Next slide. So that is, um, I just placed this image here to show you what a queen looks like. So for those who aren't beekeepers yet, um, but this is if you if you when you go into your hive, this is this is the the queen that you're looking for. This is what a queen would look like if you're looking for her, because sometimes she can be very difficult to 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 um to find, and she does not like being in the light. So she will tend to run around on the frame quite quickly, um, just to get out of um eyesight range. Next slide. As um, so this is a queen cell, um, the white, uh, um, the white um, liquid that you see at the bottom, semi-solid liquid jelly-like substance, is the royal jelly. Um, and unfortunately, um, Gavin found out quite innocently that he can't make royal jelly because it is made from a gland. Um, it, um, uh, that that is um, as Gavin would have hinted, um, combines a few mineral resources in the mouth of the bees, or uh, um, to produce that rich content that allows the queen to develop in what she is in a royal form. Um, next slide. So, um. Just, so, just, so, just before you go into beekeeping, there are a few words of caution here. <laughs> um, so the worker bees stings are barbed. And the funny thing is um, they're, they're, um, it, it causes their death, but that, that on, that's only a feature of if they sting mammals like us humans, because our skins are elastic. So they can't pull those barbs out because it was made to sting other insects primarily. However, the caution here is if, if, you, if you are allergic, um, you might want to find out before you go into beekeeping because the range of symptoms could range from anaphylactic shock to um, severe swellings. Now, I've gotten swellings before, but I'm not necessarily um, allergic because it would have been localized swellings. And it's usually when I get multiple stings in the same spot. Um, so for me, I know I'm not um, allergic, um, but just a word of caution. I do know some beekeepers who have been able to get desensitized over time. Some people are not that fortunate. Um, and I know beekeepers who've gotten um, developed um, allergies over time as well. So it can go both ways. Next slide, please. Um, so I know Mr. Smith mentioned a few things um, that can be found in the, li in, in the hive. He mentioned royal jelly. Um, he mentioned that the bees collect nectar, which turns into honey. But a lot of people don't know that there is what is called bee bread in the hive, which is where a lot of their nutrients come from, where they mix both pollen and the honey mixtures to nourish um, the, the, the larvae and the brood within um, the colony. Next slide. So um, on screen is what, um, is what the bee bread looks like. Um, I know some beekeepers actually do scoop out some, some of this and actually eat it as well. It, I actually tried it. It tastes very fermented. I personally think it does actually taste like, taste like sourdough bread. Um, so, that, but that's me. Some people might not like it. I do. Uh, to each his own. Yeah. Um, next slide. So some of the tools that we use to protect ourselves, smoker, hive tool, um, the veils that we wear. Here I've actually been in the, um, 
in the apiary here um, and their bees are so gentle that I literally was able to take off my mask, my veil and actually taste some of the honey and quickly put it back on. They still do sting, but here they've bred for gentleness in some of the farms that I've been at. Um, I've been to China and they, um, they raise a serana and I didn't have to wear a veil at all. But for our bees in Jamaica, they're a little bit more on the tough side like we Jamaicans. And so like a Jamaican mother, she they will slap you. <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily try it with Jamaican bees right out the go. But if you're a brave soul and you don't mind getting, yeah, um, I, I would suggest just wear your veils. Um, and your hive tool will help you. Now, for me, when I didn't have my hive tool, I used knives as a substitute for the, for, for the hive tool. Um, next slide. So um, this is the box that generally everybody uses in Jamaica. Um, but here in the UK, where I'm now based, they have what is called a national standard. Um, the measurements are close to this, but not quite the same. And they look like this, so you could get the Langstroth hive confused with the UK version of the um, national standard, in quote, the national UK standard, to, just, to, just to be clear. Next slide, please. Um, I also um, use top bar hives. Um, that's one of my top bar hives, as you can see me in the photo a few years back. And the, the hive, the white top bar hive is the one that I was actually opening. Um, but I'm also now through Honeybees April working on a prototype, um, which is the, um, the open source beehive type of design. And that's actually not actually made with traditional um, carpentry skills. I'm actually learning how to use a particular computer to actually make these hives. So um, give me a few years, I'll start making them and shipping them out if you're interested. Um, so just a little plug, a shameless plug there for my business. Um, skip to the next um, slide, please. So the other type of hive, which I'm also um, going to be prototyping is and testing over the next few years is the Warry hive. It's similar to the top bar hive, but it's kind of like a fusion between top bar and Langstroth, but you can't swap the, 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 the frame between um, Langstroth and top bar, unfortunately. So you'd actually have to get another Warry hive where you can switch um, frames in between um, the, 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 the type of boxes. Um, but they're, they're, they're good at producing wax like the top bar hives. Next slide. Um, Mr. Smith mentioned uh, bee propol propolis, which they actually get this from the gums of the tree. And they actually glue down anything that they don't want moving. They're like a crazy mom with super glue. When you, you know when your mom trying to fix your, your shoes because she can't afford to, to buy another shoe for you next year? And she's super glue. This, th this is even better. This is ultra super glue. Like it just glues on everything. When you become a beekeeper and you're trying to move, I I've, I've been in my apron once and trying to get the, the, the gum out of the way and literally the whole hive starts shaking. So they're really good at gluing things down. Next. Um, so this is what, um, I just wanted to put this pretty picture in um, uh, showing what the comb is. Now, um, I personally, when my combs get old, I tend to put them in a solar wax melt and melt this down. And I remember Mr. Smith talking about um, uh, additional um, income, income revenue streams that you can um, make. Um, I remember one lady, she was trying to make, make makeup and she purchased my wax from me. Um, and she said, Adrian, tell me as soon as you harvest and you melt down the wax. She collected about two pounds from me. Um, easiest money I've ever made in my life. <laughs> and she made makeup out of it. And she says the makeup that she had, she um, had made, she just didn't even need to make perfume the way it smells so sweet. And it smells so floral. So again, shameless plug in terms of supporting your local beekeepers. Next slide, please. Um, this is um, another illustration of um, uh, closed uh, um, capped honey, when it's what we call ripen, um, and uncapped honey in the bottom. Now, 
um, if you're going into beekeeping, make sure that at least the 70 percent of your frame is capped, because at least at that threshold, you know that it is it has been reduced enough to not having um, a lot of water in it. Um, so that's what well, that's when you're certain you're, that you're getting good quality honey. Next slide, please. So here we are a swarm, um, a few swarms. Now, swarming tends to occur when um, if you don't have enough space in the hive and you have multiple queens born, being born out of the colony and they need to vacate to allow the rest of the colonies to, um, to expand and grow. Um, and so this is a part of the way in which um, bees multiply themselves. Now, swarming can also happen if the area becomes unsuitable and, um, and uh, um, they're leaving. Next slide, I'm, um, I'm going to be wrapping up soon. So uh, next slide, please, very quickly. Oh, it's the end, actually. So just a little bit of insight there from, from the world of a beekeeper. Again, in closing, shameless plug, support Honey Bees Apiary, support the Kingston and St. Andrew Beekeepers Association, and I'll hand over back to Gavin so that he can allow um, Julian, Mr. Julian Spence, our president, to speak to you. Thanks very much. All right, thanks so much, Adrian. I can tell that everyone here is very passionate about their presentations and about bees based on how the time just keeps stretching, which is amazing. I love that. And I will always keep supporting that. But just need to make sure that everything is in a timely manner. So next up, we have Cheryl. We have Sherry Natural or Cherry Natural. Sorry about that. So Cherry Natural is a dub poet, writer, and self-defense instructor as well as a motivational speaker. She's Jamaica's leading female performance dub poet and writer. She's an, a self-defense instructor and a motivational speaker for both adults and children. Her focus is on poetry and self-defense, both locally and worldwide, having performed different workshops and also having worked with the Jamaican Poet Laureate, Lorna Goodison, on her or their some annual summer program in for inner city youth. Her writing focuses on social commentary and the upliftment of women and children in particular, because I'm sure that the entire world needs more of that. She has written three books and there, and she has produced two CDs and an EP that has recently come out. She, her work has been based, has been used as a basis for the PhD work of Professor John Goluska at Indiana, Indiana State University in the US. And she has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2019 International Reggae and World Music Awards for, and the award was for the best spoken word poet, as well as the award for the Queens of Reggae Internet Island Honorary Ceremonies in 2019, honoring influential women in the music industry. And she will be giving an inspiring live performance of her work right now. So, Cherry, thank you so much. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah. I don't know. You. All right. How are you? Yeah, man. Give thanks. Very informative program, you know. Yes, I'm definitely. Learning so much. Yes. All right. This piece I'm going to do is called Earth is Our Home, and it's really focused on climate change and global warming. And it mentions a lot of things that affect um, the environment. So it includes also the bees. So it's not directly focused on the bees, but I was asked to do it based because the person saw this poem on a video. All right. So it's called Earth is Our Home. Neil Armstrong could not stay on the moon for too long. Venus and Mars are our closest neighbors. No hope there for humans. The cosmos is in chaos. Global warming, climate change, ozone depletion, ozone depletion, glaciers melting, ocean rising. The sea that used to feed us is getting hungry, eating up the land, greenhouse gases, Fossil fuel emission, more carbon, less oxygen, filling our lungs with toxin. Big corporations dumping, dumping their toxic waste in our rivers and lakes, using the ocean garbage bin, garbage bin, filling it with plastic, turning, turning the water acidic, damaging the coral reef. The mangroves are on the threat. Nothing left to buffer us from storm surges and floods. The burning down the rainforest, destroying Mother Nature's asset. The birds have no place for rest. For rest. 
nowhere to breed, pollinating insects disappearing because of corporate greed. Jeez, I couldn't tell when last I see some bees. Jeez, I couldn't tell when last I see some bees. Earth is becoming a melting pot. Joni Mitchell said, the paving paradise put in a parking lots. We won't know what we have got until it's gone. The running away the bees, replacing the trees with concrete. Lack of vision. If they can't see the problems, they need to see an optician. If they can't see the problems, they need to see an optician. Mother Earth is suffocating. She can't breathe. Her lungs are blocked. Capitalism hands are around her neck and its knees in her back. Earth is our only home, our only home. We are connected to the mountains, the rivers, the trees, even the rock stone. Let's preserve the planet we live on. There is no plan. Net B, if something goes wrong on this one, our collective survival depends on everyone's cooperation. Everyone's cooperation. We won't know what we have got until it's gone. The running away the bees, replacing the trees with concrete. Lack of vision. If they can't see the problems, they need to see an optician. Optician, give thanks. Hi, right, thank you so much, Cherry Natural, for that inspiring poem. It was, it really rang true for a lot of the issues that we have to this day, whether it is worth at this country, in this country, or across the world. So many different corporations, different businesses, our own activities that are causing so much damage for the environment, for all the things that we need to survive. And as you mentioned, we need to work together to be able to solve these issues and to make sure that they don't get any, that they don't get any worse in the future. So thank you so much for that. Give thanks. Yes, awesome. So next we have Mr. Julian Spence, who is the president of the Kingston and St. Andrew Beekeeper Association, and he'll be talking just to give us some inspiration about what we can do and how we can and need to actually manifest our work and our energy to make sure that we can protect and do just as Cherry Natural said, protect and preserve our resources and our environment. Mr. Spence? Afternoon. Afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Thank you for inviting me and I'm going to try and be brief and, and um, just cover what I think is relevant for the day, World Bee Day. I should emphasize that I don't have a fancy um, presentation like you and Adrian, but I'm just going to talk and um, there the chat is open. So if there are some questions along the way, feel free to put them in there. But let me start off by saying today was World Bee Day, first time it's being um, sort of celebrated in Jamaica which is a good sign because it now means that the Ministry of Agriculture, policymakers, decision makers are, are acknowledging the importance of bees. And that, of course, is part of the education process. Um, so we need to, to accept that, acknowledge that, and realize that bees have, in fact, been overlooked for too long. In first world countries, in the last 5, 10, 15 years, they've been talking about colony collapse, bees collapsing, and and they have seen and felt the problems of bees going away. Now, in those parts of the world, a lot of money is made by people who have hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of, of, of hives that they put on flatbed trucks and they roll them into California, into armored orchards. They, they roll them into farms. And their sole purpose of making money is not honey, is not propolis, is none of those things, it's pollination, because it's critical to food supply. You know, a, a saying I've heard is I heard many people say that they don't like bees, but I've never heard anybody saying they don't like to eat. And these two things are inextricably linked with each other because over 70% of the food we eat is pollinated by bees. And it's something that we cannot underestimate, we cannot forget, we cannot lose sight of if we as a nation are going to be continuing to make sure that we have food and food security. And so that is a critical point that I want to get a, across to, to, to everybody today is the importance of it. What you find is that when you mention bees to people, most people, and a lot of this is focused on young people. I hope there's some young people here who are, well, compared to me, everybody's young, but there's some people who um, are not bee farmers, but they may be just interested in listening. Um, 
you think of bees, you think of stings, and you think of honey. And that is all very well and good, but the most important task of the bee is neither one of those, it's pollination. And we need to understand the critical nature of it. Um, part of what the ministry did today and other people have mentioned is the importance of planting trees. Over the last week, we've been in different schools, different places at the ministry today, planting fruit trees, because this is going to go a long way to help sustain the, 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 the ecosystem. Um, and that is critical to allowing us to be able to maintain the system, the environment that we live in and make sure it's healthy and make sure we have the biodiversity is there. There's a lot of insects out there. People talk about big ones, little ones, small ones, ugly ones, poisonous ones. But of course, I'm biased, but my the one I love the most is the bee because the bee works hard, the bee's focused on it on his job, and the bee does so much for us as humans that it's unbelievable to think about what would happen if we didn't have the bee. I mean, I don't want to paint, paint a, a doom and gloom picture, but if we didn't have bees, very soon we would not have, and I'm talking about months going into maybe six months to a year, we would not have a lot of food that we that we live to survive on. And as a, as a society, the human race would go into decline and would, would vanish if we let the bees go away. And I'm not being dramatic. It's been taught, it's been proven, it's been researched. And so we need to understand the importance of that. So that being said, um, we, we've talked about the linkages between food and food supply. We talk about the fruit trees that we've been trying to plant, things we take for granted, you know, ackee, jackfruit, guava, pomegranate, sweet sop, sour sop, all those, those, fruit, those, those trees um, are all pollinated by bees. And if you take the time, as Mr. Smith was talking about, look at the flowers. Next time you walk under a tree, whether it's a palm tree, a tree, whatever it is, and you hear it buzzing, don't run and be afraid of getting stung. Stop, look up, and just observe these magnificent insects at work, flying back and forth, flower to flower, collecting nectar, collecting pollen, and taking it back to their hives. I have bees at home. They're very close to my house. I can sit down on the veranda in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, and the sun's coming up, and I can see them all flying out and going to work. They make a noise because they're getting ready to go out, and they come, start coming back in. And it's a, a magnificent sight when you realize what they're producing. Obviously, I can look into my hive week after week, and I can see what they produce when they're bringing in honey. But it certainly is a journey and an exercise which is very rewarding to look at and to understand the critical nature of what bees do for us and how they help us as humans to, to survive and, and, and to move forward. Um, as far as the, the business side of it, because uh, you know a lot of people have talked about, about it. And I just want to jump, put some things in perspective because um, I started as a hobby. And to be honest with you, I'm a I'm an electronic engineer by training, and I'm involved in the electronic security industry. So I'm not I'm not a, a bee farmer that's focused solely on bees. Bees are still a hobby, which I enjoy. I wish I could have more time to spend with them, but um, I'm I'm blessed and I'm fortunate to be able to have bees at my house that don't disturb people. And the point I'm trying to make is that. It, there's a huge potential for people who raise bees. It's a relatively easy industry to get into. As Adrian men mentioned, one of the first things you need to do is go and get a couple of stings. And if you survive that without too much discomfort, then that means that's the first indication to say, hey, let me take this thing seriously. Bodles, where Mr. Smith operates from, and Hart, NTVet offer training. So you can say, hey, let me go and get some training. And you start off and get some training, you understand what's involved. It's not terribly difficult. It needs to, you just need to have the passion in your heart for it. Open mind, learn, and you'll find that there's a lot of people willing to help you. You can start off with two colonies. I, I as I mentioned just at another forum today, food for the poor involved in the program. And a neighbor of mine called my wife many, many years ago. My wife had been praying about it, and, she, and the neighbor said, You know, I'm getting 10, 10 hives from food for the poor today, but I can only have space for five. Would you like them? And of course, my wife said, yes, of course. Then I get a call from her to say, honey, we're getting five hives from, from food for the poor. 
you got to go figure out where to put them. Of course, this is at six o'clock at night. I didn't know anything about leaves. Anyway, a few things later, we found a place to put them. The house was full of bees because my wife didn't know that they loved to follow the light and she left the, hope the light on at home and the, and the door was open and the house was full of bees afterwards. But anyway, it's part of the learning curve. And now, you know, many, many years later, I'm involved in, in bees. I, I've tried to help people out in whatever way I can. We have an association. We have a, a WhatsApp group that we have for close to 100 members in there. We try to stay focused on bee-related matters. There's people who are relatively new, just getting into it. They ask questions. We have beekeepers have been doing it for 30, 40 years. They're happy to share their knowledge. They're happy to share their wisdom. Sometimes if people are living, operating in the same area, a young bee farmer will draw alongside an older bee farmer and they'll get help. They'll share the knowledge and, and it's a supportive system. Now, as I talked about the business, um, bees don't make honey all day, every day. If you have bees, you get flows of honey that come with the season. As with the rain, as with the drought, you have seasonal growth of plants and flowers and the bees go out and then they harvest and then they store and then you can reap. So as bee farmers, you may be able to reap honey for two or maybe three to three times a year, depending on climatic conditions. So it's not like a water tap where you just turn it on and you get honey, you turn it off and it doesn't happen. It's not like that. So you have to work with the bees, manage the hives, understand what they're doing, help them along with the process. When there's a dearth period means it's a drought. Maybe they've had, you know, tropical storms. A lot of the, 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 the blooms have, have, have gone. You have to feed, hunt, feed bees. Now, it's one of the few things why people like to get into bees because unlike chickens, pigs, cattle, et cetera, you have to feed them all the time. You don't with bees. For, set, for many years, I didn't have to feed my bees until things got bad sometimes with a drought. And then you have to feed them and it's relatively easy to feed them. You just mix up a mixture of sugar and water, put it in plastic bags, put it in the hives and they're happy and they're, and they're like, okay, we've got food, we're good and we're going to keep multiplying and, and doing our business. Why I'm emphasizing the importance of this is because I'm noticing more and more young people getting into beekeeping. And it's a great thing because over the years, I know a lot of elderly people, my age and older, have been in it for a long time. And then they're like, there's no family around them. There's nobody to take over the bees. They get older, they can't help looking, looking after the bees anymore. And it kind of just wanes away. And the wealth of knowledge that has been gained is gone. So it's been very important to try and encourage young people to get involved with the, the industry to, as it, as it says, going a call to action is to get involved in it and see it as a way that you can make a living because the demand for honey is huge. When I say huge, we can hardly even supply our local demands. When I sp started to talk to people overseas about honey and export, they were like, yes, yes, we definitely want it. From As Adrian could tell you, he was in China. There's a huge demand for, for honey in China. And one of the things that Jamaica has is we have a brand. Most things come out of Jamaica, whether it's coffee, whether it's sugarcane, whether it's ganja, whether it's honey, people want it because it has a, a good brand and it's a quality product. We have the Ministry of Agriculture has a, a, a facility with the EU that they've had in place for like 15 years and they have to pay every year to keep the option open. And we as a country have not exported any honey to those markets and there's a huge demand for it and anywhere where you can produce something locally using local ingredients using local labor using the bees and turn it into something you can export to earn foreign exchange has great potential so i say this to anybody who's thinking about doing it who's um got the the, the, the passion who may have the willingness and the time seriously think about it Contact your association. It doesn't have to be Kingston and St. Andrew, which we're involved with, but contact your relevant association. Get some support. It doesn't take a lot to get started. You can start with two hives. And the beautiful thing about it is that you, when you understand, you can actually split your hives and you just need to buy the boxes and the boards and the frames and you can split and grow and grow and grow. I was talking to somebody today who got their starter from from um, from Food for the Poor. They started with five hives and they have over 80 hives now in a relatively short period of, of time. When you get up to that level of, of hives, you have a, a business that you can sustain you and that has a great potential for growth. 
So I say and want to encourage persons that this is something that you can take on as a business. You don't have to do it full time when you start, but if you, you do it and you start to grow and see how it how it expands, it gives you the potential to realize that now I can have something that I can develop on, that I can grow into. And there are so many value added things. We're just talking about honey, which is easy thing that we the people talk about today at an uh, event at the Ministry of um, Agriculture and Fisheries. There were people there with propolis shampoo, propolis ointment. There's pollen, all sorts of products that pollen goes into, beeswax goes into cosmetics. There's a lot of value added products that come out of this industry that have huge potential. People are looking more for natural, organic type of products. People want to move away from the artificial mass produced type of cosmetics and, and other things, and they want to gravitate towards natural type of things. So there's a huge market for that. It just takes persons who with that entrepreneurial spirit, that passion, that you know, want to do sort of things to find a way to find a niche product, to expand on it and to move it. And that is one of the things that I want, well, some of the things that I want to encourage people to think about, encourage farmers who may be just starting out now to encourage them to grow, to take it a little more seriously. And there's all sorts of support services you can get, whether it's the ministry or other facilities to help you set up a business. There's the SRC um, that, that have a facility for bottling. They'll bottle all your honey for your sterilizing bottles, do all that sort of thing for a very minimal cost you know, of a couple of thousand dollars, literally. Um, so it's something that you can find the help if you come up with products that you want to develop. You can go to the SRC. They will sit down with you. They have the technical expertise, the scientific expertise to, to take your idea, your concept and say, okay, it works when you make it at home in your kitchen and you've done a batch of 10 or 15 items. But to do it as a business, you have to do 500. And this is what you're going to need to do to the 500. And do 500. Um, units consistently up to a standard that can meet international standards and be certified and registered. So um, there's a lot of help and resources out there. And so the call to action is there. And I will close on that note. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Spence, for all sorry, that. You know, oh, sorry, sorry. there's one thing, one thing I forgot to, to mention, and it's just part of the education process. Um, what happened is that I put my, my phone number is tied to the, the Kingston St. Andrew Beekeepers Association. And what I find is I'm getting calls from people weekly about to come and collect swarms. So what I'm realizing that people are realizing whether they're, 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 it's in their business place or at their home, or like I got a call this week from a fire station um, where and Adrian alluded to where, where bees swarm naturally for whatever reasons, and they will just move out of a hive. And in the process of going to try and find another place, they will land in a tree, land in a business place. And of course, you know, the people who are operating, this is a picture of a bee that went, the swarm that went into a forklift at a factory. You ask me why they end up in the forklift, but the man, the business couldn't operate because a forklift couldn't use because nobody was going to go into it. But I say it to say is that, the, the people are realizing instead of trying to kill the swarm or to kill the bees, they call us. Um, I, I get the information from the persons where it is, contact name and number. I put it into a WhatsApp group. And we have farmers who are geared up, ready to roll, jump into their car with all their tools, go on and take on the task of recovering a swarm and put it into what is a nice home for them, which is put it into a high body, dark place, bees like, that's going to be managed, maintained, and looked after. So it's a great process. Everybody's happy. The person who's had the swarm at their business place or home are happy it's no longer there, but we're also happy, and they're happy that it's now gone to a place where it's actually not going to die. It's going to serve a, a purpose and be useful. And so what that says to me is that people are realizing it's not something to be scared of or frightened of to go and kill the hive, but to, there are people who will come and you know, take it away and put it, give the bees a home, which is what they're really looking for, and support them, and everybody is happy at the end of the day. So for that, I'm thankful. Back to you. 
I'm thankful for that too. I really like bees and insects in general. So to hear that they can be not instantly murdered and just sent somewhere else where they can have a home and produce resources that we could use. I love hearing that. So thank you so much, Mr. Spence, for sharing that with us and bringing us to the forefront of getting something done, something, getting more done with bees. So thank you for sharing that. There's one last thing that I'd like to add before we close and move over to the, um, the Natural History Museum. So Bees, as we've been talking about today, have been incredibly important. We've been focusing on honeybees for different industries, but bees do not operate in isolation. Honeybees don't operate in isolation. They work as a colony, but there are also several other species of wild bees that are also incredibly important for pollinating other plants and even other crops as well as other insects that help to pollinate different plants across the world. And in recognition of World Biodiversity, which is in the next two days, just want to slide that in there to show that there is a whole network of organisms that help support bees, honeybees, and other insects and support our industries. So let us be more conscious of that and their roles in them. And now I switch over to Eartha at the Natural History Museum for the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Gavin. And I'd like to use this opportunity to thank each and everyone for taking the time to be here today. You're staying with us throughout the entire program and your support for efforts such as these show the level of commitment and quest for knowledge surrounding the sustainable use of Earth's resources and also the unique role our bees play with respect to our survival. Now, this program would not have been possible without the kind sponsorship of Highway 2000 East-West, quite instrumental in the support of educational initiatives such as these. To our program participants, Ms. Grano, we appreciate you opening the program in such a warm manner and for highlighting important role of the Institute of Jamaica and the Natural History Museum of Jamaica. Mr. Hugh Smith, your comprehensive presentation, I'm sure, has inspired persons to consider the value of bees and also being a part of the beekeeping industry. Thank you, Cherry Natural. You brought such vibes and creativity to such a serious topic and has left us to consider the impact our actions have had on our shared home and our bees. Mr. Adrian Watson, we truly enjoyed your enriching presentation. It has always been a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Mr. Julian Spence, for closing this session. Important information and call to action, we really appreciate it. You easily placed everything into perspective. Thank you. To our host, Mr. Dr. Gavin Campbell, you have infused great energy and enthusiasm into your role and have kept our audience engaged. We definitely see your passion. Well done and thank you. To our colleagues, particularly the education staff of the Natural History Museum of Jamaica, you have assisted in such an important role to ensure smooth transitions at the controls. Thank you so much. We are appreciate the of all other members of the Natural History Museum of Jamaica in various supportive and administrative roles as well. From vetting the to relevant feedback, all are appreciated at this time. So, we have now come to the close of another wonderful session. Thank you all for such excellent company. And I want each and everyone to stay tuned to our social media pages to hear any updates that we have for our upcoming events. And so thank you again, everyone. Hey. I just want to say thank you so much for having invited me to host on behalf of the NCST. We're always happy to be able to support any kind of innovations and any kind of results that help protect our natural resources. So thank you so much. And we're happy to be involved in any future events.
thank you too for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Glad to help. Indeed. Thank you. I appreciate hanging out with all the young people. Bye-bye. <laughs>